When Chaplain Katie talks about there will be some stories about Doug, it certainly hit me that maybe there are some stories that you don't want to know, Sylvia. <laughs> I, I, I've, I knew Doug for 62 years. We were classmates right here. And for the first few decades after our graduation, we didn't keep in touch because he was in Vietnam and everywhere in the world, as was I. But we met again, I believe it was our 25th or 30th reunion. And we stayed friends after that. We did some things, including going to Hooters. <laughs> Sylvia, confession. And I visited Doug in the hospital, and he couldn't talk, but he could hear. And I know he was answering me because he moved his lips. And Sylvia, you don't know, want to know what we, we said to each other. But you probably, you, you probably can imagine. But it was a wonderful ride with Doug. He certainly had a lot of deep thoughts, deep roots, deep spirituality about himself. And he reminded me of a article I recently saw by the great Russian novelist Vladimir Ilyich Nabokov. And a particular sentence stayed with me. We all are crashing to our inevitable fate, Nabokov wrote, from the top story of our birth to the flat stones of the churchyard and wondering at the patterns on the passing wall. Probably one of the most dynamic patterns on the passing wall of my life is this institution which I will call Georgia Military Academy forever. Sorry. But I've been forgiven for that. And knowing Doug and Sylvia is certainly one of the highlights, one of the great patterns on the passing wall of my life. I'm also reminded of a short story by one of my favorite authors, James Thurber. And the story is called Oliver and the Other Ostriches. Oliver and the Other Ostriches. An austere ostrich of awesome authority was lecturing younger ostriches one day on the superiority of their species above all other species. We were known to the Romans, or rather the Romans were known to us, he said. They called us Avis Struthio and we call them Romans. The Greeks called us struthion, which means truthful one, or if it doesn't, it should. We're the biggest birds, and therefore, the best. All his listeners cried, hear, hear, except a thoughtful one named Oliver. We can't fly backward like the hummingbird, he said aloud. The hummingbird is Lose it ground, said the old ostrich. We're going places, we're moving forward. Here, here, cried all the other ostriches except Oliver. We lay the biggest eggs and therefore the big best eggs, mentioned the old, continued the old lecturer. The robin's eggs are prettier, said Oliver. Robin's eggs produce, produce nothing but robins said the old ostrich, and robins are nothing more than long-bound worm eggs. Hear, hear, cried all the other ostriches, except Oliver. We get along on four toes, whereas man needs ten, the elderly instructor told his class. But man is sitting down and we can't fly at all, commented Oliver. The old ostrich glared at him severely, first with one eye and then the other. Man is flying too fast for a world that is round, he said, and soon he will catch up with himself in a great rear-end collision. And man will never know that what hit man from behind was man. 
Hear, hear, cried all the other ostriches, except Oliver. We can make ourselves invis invisible in time of peril by sticking our heads in the sand. Nobody else can do that. How do we know we can't be seen if we can't see, demanded Oliver. Sophistry, screamed the old ostrich. And all the other ostriches, except Oliver, repeated sophistry, having no idea what it meant. Just then, the master of the class heard a great alarming sound, the sound of thunder growing close and growing closer. But it wasn't the sound of weather, however. It was the sound of a herd of rogue elephants in full stampede, frightened by nothing, fleeing nowhere. Just then, Oliver, the, the, the old ostriches and his students quickly stuck their head in the sand while Oliver took refuge behind a close nearby rock until the storm of beasts had passed. When he came out, he beheld a sea of sand and stones and feathers, all that was left of the old lecturer and his disciples. But just to make sure, Oliver called Roll, and there was no answer until he came to his own name. Oliver, said Oliver, hear, hear, except Oliver. And there was no further sound on the desert except for the faint final rumbling of thunder on the horizon. Now, as did Aesop in his fables, Thurber left a moral to that story. We build our house and yet our faith upon the sand, uh, upon the rock, not upon the sand. Doug, old buddy, wherever you are, simplify who are. Now, Sylvia demanded that I talk about an, a particular incident that happened in the mid-50s in our class, the class of 1956. The Commandant of Cadets, Colonel John R. Burnett, was a gruff old World War II retired Army Colonel who demanded perfection. And he drove an old English Ford from his home just a couple blocks away onto the campus and was always running into things. So one time, he came in and missed the gate and drove his car up the stairs to, was it Founders Hall, Memorial Hall? The, the main academic building. And when he, when he came in and saw it, he called his, all of his cadet officers in and said, Somebody get that goddamn thing out of there. And everybody suffered. Now, Sylvia, I can't tell you that Doug was an instigator, but he was involved. So there were many other incidents, and I didn't know Doug well enough then to know that he was the one who, who established a rope ladder out of one of the windows of the hall where he was living. And what happened when cadets went down and back up that ladder? Sylvia, I don't know, because I was not involved. So I'm proud to remember Doug. I was proud to go see him several times when he was in the hospital. And, and, and we tried to talk, and he, I know he understood me. Sylvia, you acknowledge that. Again, I'm not going to tell you what we said to each other, but you know. So thank you for this opportunity to reflect and remember my old friend, Doug Talley.
you are able and join us in eternal Father throne this day. <laughs> hearing our, our joyful stories today um, and thank you Dr. Shore for, for sharing some of that joy of your time with Doug um, but I think it's also because everyone knew loved and delighted in their relationship with Doug that there is grief in this room today as well our joy alongside him came first and it's because of that joy that there is sorrow now and even in that sorrow, I pray that we rejoice in Doug's beautiful faith through the reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Here ends the lesson. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith, said Paul in 2 Timothy. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. We're here to celebrate the life of Douglas Bird Talley and his promotion his ultimate promotion from the church militant here on earth to the church triumphant in heaven. Doug's life can be exemplified by service, sacrifice, study, 
submission, and ultimately, salvation. And that service and sacrifice especially is in the role of a warrior. Doug's life had been marked out for that kind of service very early in life as he graduated from this institution, which was then called Georgia Military Academy, in 1956. Upon graduation, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy to serve as a medic. He graduated from the Class A Hospital Corps School, from the Class B Independent Duty Hospital Corps School, and from the Class C Field Medical Service School, and he served with the 2nd Marine Division. Navy and Marines often served together. In 1958, a alliance of Egypt and Syria threatened the pro-American government of Lebanon, and so with Operation Blue Bat, Doug landed with the 1st Battalion there in Beirut, and Doug's service, and that of many others, led to a coalition government over Lebanon that gave stability to Lebanon and also, I might add, gave protection to Lebanese Christians. Half a world away, Vietnam was faced with communist aggression. Doug left the Navy, re-enlisted in the Marines as a gunnery sergeant in 1962, and as the Vietnam War became increasingly unpopular with the politically correct classes in America, Doug served five combat tours in Vietnam. He was wounded five times. He received a battlefield commission as a captain in 1965, promoted to major in 1966, and commanded the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion. He saw death and dying on a regular basis. On one occasion, his entire recon platoon was wiped out with Doug being the only survivor. Doug, for his service, was awarded the Silver Star, which next to the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross is the third highest honor given in the military, given for gallantry in combat, he was awarded three bronze stars for heroic service, five purple hearts for his five wounds in battle. But he was a commander who never lost the heart of a medic. <coughs> Many a Marine died in his arms, and part of Doug died with them. In later years, he would cry when he thought about them, and he would wonder, as survivors often do, why did I survive while they died? The answer, of course, is that God enabled him to survive because God had a further plan for his life. Carl Marlantes, a Marine lieutenant and a Vietnam veteran, in his book, What It Is Like to Go to War, notes that many suffer from this syndrome. But he notes also that war involves the taking and sparing and saving of human life, which is normally the role of God. And he says soldiers who go to war therefore must have proper moral and spiritual training. Doug had that kind of spiritual training, that kind of moral training. I suspect that some of it he probably learned right here in these hallowed walls. Doug's service obviously also included a great deal of sacrifice, and that's the second element I'd like to stress about his life. As American attention shifted from communism to Islam, and as Vietnam faded from the public memory and places like Iraq and Afghanistan loomed bright instead, American attention was faced upon the Taliban and upon its cruelty, upon its repression, particularly upon its bombing of schools throughout Afghanistan, thus creating a generation of illiterates. Like almost everyone else in America, 
Doug was appalled at the repression and illiteracy in Afghanistan. Unlike almost everyone else, Doug did something about it. And here is where the Knights Templar come in. At the Grand Convent of the Sovereign Military Order of the Temple of Jerusalem at West Point, Doug heard Prince Ali Siraj of the Afghan royal household tell how the Taliban had obliterated so much of Afghanistan, leaving a generation of Afghans illiterate. Back home in Georgia, Doug heard the same thing from an Air Force major. And then he also learned that former prisoners of war and Admiral and United States Senator Jeremiah Denton had offered the program that would provide military transit for supplies to Afghanistan. Knowing all this, Doug went into action. Working with the Templars, he spearheaded Project Afghanistan 2003, a project that gathered and shipped 22 tons of school supplies to Afghanistan. But Doug made one requirement of this. He said, if I'm going to have any part of this at all, girls have to be allowed in those schools as well. We have no way of knowing how many Afghan children learned to read and write as a result of Doug's efforts, or how their lives were changed, or how they changed Afghanistan and the rest of the world, and how they will change it in the future. But in the book, Not Unto Us, book of the history of the Templars, the Grand Master James Carey describes Project Afghanistan as the greatest act of Christian charity in the history of the modern Templar order. Doug gave sacrificially to this effort, sacrificially to the Templars as a whole, and also to other organizations. He was a life member of the Clan Douglas Society, a member of the Robert Burns Society, a member of the John Collins chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution, a member of the Raymond G. Davis Post of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And in all of these, Doug gave sacrificially of his time, talent, and treasure. It has been said that if a nation separates its scholars from its warriors, it will have its thinking done by cowards, and it's fighting done by fools. Doug was a scholar as well as a warrior. And that's the, first, the third point I'd like to stress, study. I came to know Doug through the sovereign military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. I had learned about this order. I had an interest in it. And I was invited to a Templar Christmas party somewhere in the North Atlanta area. That was around the year 2006. There at the party, as I met a number of these people, I said that I was really interested in learning more about the Templars, about the Crusades, and about the history of this order. I was immediately told, there is a man here then that you need to meet. And they ushered me into the presence of Doug Talley. That was the first of many stimulating conversations that we had and a budding and growing friendship based on mutual respect. As we talked about Templar history, we didn't always agree on every detail. Our conversations would have been rather boring if we had, but we did agree on our love of God and country, our love of the military, our love of the Templars, our love of knightly chivalry, and our love of the old values that made this nation what it is. Several years after I entered the Templars, the Holy Road Priory here had a list of books on Templar history. Most of those books had been supplied by Doug Talley. I recall one occasion I faced some criticism for my role as the chaplain, obviously unjustly. And they said I talked too long, and obviously I didn't. I thought about resigning. 
Doug Talley took me aside. And he didn't advise me to stay on as chaplain. He ordered me to stay on as chaplain. And I did. And I'm very glad that I did. There was another time I took an order from the Talleys, and that was from Sylvia. It was one time when I was recovering from pneumonia, and I still thought that I was healthy enough to come to the convent and give my homily. Sylvia, drawing upon her nursing experience, assured me that I was not, that my services were valuable but not indispensable, and that I needed to stay home. I emailed her my homily at that time. I think you're the one that delivered it, aren't you? Anyway, that's probably one of the reasons I'm still here and alive today. And I'm sure many of the other Templars are thankful to Sylvia that I wasn't there. <laughs> Doug served the Sovereign Military Order for 36 years. He received the dignity of the Grand Cross, the Grand Commander, and the Order of Merit, and many more that I probably don't even know about. Doug didn't tell me about any of these. He didn't tell me about his military heroism. He didn't tell me about Project Afghanistan or the other honors or areas of service that he had engaged in. Because Doug followed the motto of the Templar as a motto from Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. And with that humility, we come to the fourth element, submission. Doug knew that he could not do all of this alone. He needed the help of a higher power, and he submitted to that higher power. Sometimes God leads us by hitting us over the head and getting our attention. Sometimes he does so more subtly by planting seeds, seeds that grow in our lives and in our souls with time. In Doug's life, those seeds had been planted much, much earlier. Many of them, I'm sure, were planted right here. But I'm going to tell you a story, a story that Sylvia says I should tell. And whether you take this story as divine providence or an accident or whatever you want to call it, Here's what Doug told me the day that he asked me to conduct his funeral. He told me that his grandparents had been Roman Catholic and that when his mother was born, she was not expected to survive her first night on earth. And so they sent someone down to the rectory to find the priest to have him come back and baptize her at the hospital. Well, the priest wasn't at the rectory, so they went downtown to look for him, and they found a man wearing a clerical collar of a Lutheran pastor. Assuming that he was a Catholic priest, they explained the situation and asked him to come and baptize their daughter, and he, assuming they were Lutherans, agreed. So he came, he performed the baptism. When they filled out the paperwork afterward, they he said, you mean you're Lutheran? And he said, yes, and now so is she. <laughs> they took that as a sign from God that they were to raise Doug's mother as a Lutheran, and she raised Doug as a Lutheran as well. Take that in whatever way you wish. But Doug's submission to God led to his salvation. Doug and Sylvia had a great love and respect for each other, in their 37 years of marriage. Sylvia played such a major part in his life and in the Templars as well. And another major part of his life was, of course, the beloved children, Jimmy and Chris and Kathy. Doug loved Sylvia's Temple Sinai, and he loved the traditions and teachings of Judaism. And Sylvia respected the fact that Doug was a Christian. Doug knew that all of his good works and service could not earn heaven. He trusted the captain of his salvation, Jesus Christ, who died for his sins and rose for his justification. And I am therefore confident 
that Doug is in heaven to, with God today and that we will see him again. As a closing prayer, no more fitting prayer for a Navy man and a Marine could be given than that which was attributed to Sir Francis Drake, an English sea captain in the 1500s, the second sailor to circumnavigate the globe. I'd like you to pray with me as we give this prayer. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dreamed too little, when we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wilder seas, where storms will show your mastery, where, losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push back the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. As I think of Doug in the future, and I think of his loyalty and love of his Scottish heritage, I've always remembered those thrilling words from Autun's Lays of the Scottish Cavaliers. All night long, the northern streamers shot across the trembling sky, fearful lights that never beckon, save when kings and heroes die. A hero has died, a warrior has fallen, but he rests securely in the arms of a loving God. Major Douglas Bird Talley, son of Scotland, American soldier, knight of Christ, good friend and mentor, I salute you and I bid you farewell and may you rest in God's peace till we meet again. I've been asked to announce there will be no formal recessional, 
but there will be a light lunch served in the back that you're all invited to join. Let's stand as we have the benediction. The benediction will be taken from Rudyard Kipling's Recessional, 1897. God of our fathers, known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Still stands thine ancient sacrifice, an humble and a contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Far called, our navies melt away, on dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge of the nations, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Amen. Thank you.